Poso mau ni wirk, wai wanen kitane ni mua e joski pietaya posnotoman e yum MITW podcast. A jospis pietaya posnapi notoman e ne hisikimaka e joso matname neho kihi. Welcome to the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin podcast. The MITW podcast is where you can get monthly updates from the tribe and our tribal departments with your hosts, Sheena Wapoos and Gary Dodge. On this episode, we have the Menominee Nation News, Community Resource Center, and Aging and Long-Term Care. We also have an interview with the Conservation Department. We have some upcoming community events for the month of November. St. Michael's Church is having their Holiday Bazaar on Saturday, November 23rd from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. There's a Native American Artist Arts and Crafts Sale at the Historic Preservation Cultural Museum on November 15th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. On Saturday, November 9th, there's a Harvest Festival at the Assembly of God Church from 2 p.m. until 5 p.m. This Friday, November 8th, Historic Preservation will be hosting their annual Community Traditional Ghost Supper at the Menominee Logging Camp Museum. It starts at 5.30 p.m. This week, Tuesday and Wednesday, November 5th and 6th, 2019 Coats for Kids will be held at the Kashina Rec Center from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. This is Chris Anderson and Patrick Delabru from Menominee Nation News talking about some stuff that happened this fall that can be read about in recent issues of Menominee Nation News. The Menominee Indian High School recently had its own homecoming, but much more attention has been given to a homecoming celebration at Clintonville High School, where a mock powwow dance has drawn criticism from Menominees and several other tribal leaders in the area. We're trying to counterbalance their disappointment in Clintonville School District personnel for letting this happen and working with them to make amends along with asking tribal members to refrain from making threatening and derogatory comments on social media and in other venues. The Lumberjack Breakfast was held at the Menominee Tribal Historic Preservation for the the first weekend in October, and besides the breakfast meal, visitors also got to see some traditional arts and practices such as black ash basket making and wild rice processing. Other presentations were about stereotypical native imagery, industrial hemp use, and what the recently founded Department of Agriculture and Food Services has been doing to promote gardening and food sovereignty. Ten candidates have announced their candidacy for Menominee Tribal Legislature, and four candidates have announced their candidacy for the Menominee Tribal Enterprises Board of Directors. Primary elections for the Menominee Tribal Legislature will be November 13th in Neopit and November 14th in Kashina. General elections will take place in January. The election of the MTE board members takes place during the annual MTE business meeting on December 14th. Candidate stances will be available in a future issue of Menominee Nation News that will be sent to all eligible Menominee voters. The S. Verna Fowler Library recently dedicated its new interactive language mural in its children's section. Visitors to the library can hear Menominee words and phrases relative to the time of year when they push a voice box and have one of the five major Menominee clan animals talk to them. After a month, new words and phrases are put on the voice boxes. After a few years of delay... The St. Joseph Cemetery in South Branch is expanding thanks to the efforts of several community elders and volunteers. Work on the new section of the cemetery began this month and should be finished by the beginning of November. The new section of the cemetery will contain 383 plots. A deer got caught in some of the fence netting by the Rainbow Falls Saloon, the out the outskirts of Neopit, but it was eventually untangled and ran off into the woods after being attended to by several area conservation and law enforcement officers. Other stories that can be read about are various walks and other events marking October being Domestic Violence Awareness Month and also recognizing other women's health issues. 
Menominee Indian High School teacher Benjamin Greeno winning WEAC's Excellence in Education Award, the Kashina Assembly God Church putting on a massive clothing drive and a harvest festival, the New Opet based Woodland Boys and Girls Club setting up some operations at Kashina, Native American presidential candidate Mark Charles visiting the reservation, 11 year old Ayana Okamash's success in the boxing ring, how Menominees and other Native Americans in the area celebrated the recent renaming of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, and various Halloween activities that have been taking place. Next issues of Menominee Nation News are available every other Monday. Our next issue will be available Monday, November 4. The following issue will be available Monday, November 18th, with a deadline of Wednesday, November 6. You can also receive updates by subscribing to our e-newsletter. Text the word Menominee to 22828 to get started. For more information on advertising and subscriptions, or to share a story idea, call 715-799-5167. For Menominee Nation News, I'm Patrick. And I'm Chris. So with us today, we have Ashley Wapkini from the Community Resource Center. She is the Recruitment and Training Coordinator. So Ashley, this past month at CRC, you guys had the Haunted Hallway event. How did that go? Well, by far, it's been the best year that we've ever had in the past nine years. This year, we had 777 participants. We raised $2,335, and with the proceeds with that, we applied $844 to Natives Against Heroin and $844 to Coats for Kids, and the remaining of it we split in half and then went to the churches in Neopit and Kashina, St. Anthony's and St. Michael's, and we bought hygiene products for both the churches. Great. So every month I create the training calendar, which I'm here today to talk to you about, for the month of Pakatakamakeso Awe, which means it's ground freezing moon, November. We are having the following classes or services. ACE Interface will be held at our building at 9.30 a.m. by Gina Washnawatuk. The ACE study confirms that adversity during development increases the risk of physical, mental, and behavioral problems later in life. The study has taught us that ACEs are the leading cause of health and social problems in our nation. The next class is the Social Security Services. It's continued every single Tuesday, so if you are seeking a Social Security card, for yourself or a minor, you will need to call Lynette Maskewitt at Aging and Long-Term Care at 715-799-5240 for an appointment. And she will then tell you what you need to bring in order to be seen. Next is tape testing. We now offer this service to the public, and you are welcome to either come in as a walk-in or call me for an appointment at 715-799-5137. And if you are wondering what a TAPE test is, it stands for Test of Adult Basic Education. It basically evaluates your academic level to give colleges or anyone that requires you to have a TAPE test to know where your educational level is at. This service is free, and again, all you have to do is come to the Community Resource Center and ask for me. Next is Organization Basics. This workshop will assist you with the ideas to keep track of all those important items, prioritize important dates and meetings to help using your time efficiently. Followed by that topic, we will go over Credit Karma. You can learn how to access the website, create an account, and understand what your credit means and ways to improve it. And at the end of the month, we have Ribbon Skirt Making. Teaching this class will be Patricia Peters and Jamie Awanape. You can learn how to make a ribbon skirt from start to finish. All materials and supplies will be available. Please be sure to attend all three classes from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. to ensure completion of your project. Feel free to bring in additional materials for your creation. And this wraps up Pakata Kamek Queso Awe training calendar for the month. Hope to see you at our building, and please like our Facebook page called MITW Community Resource Center, where you can locate our training calendar for the month and see the current job postings from day to day. We have Kristen from Aging and Long-Term Care with us to discuss Alzheimer's Awareness Month. 
Hi, my name is Kristen Waka. I am the Tribal Dementia Care Specialist from Aging and Long-Term Care. My job is basically creating awareness for the community about what dementia is and different types and trying to erase the stigma of dementia and trying to get people early, um, early detection and trying to keep people who are living with this disease to stay in their home longer. Okay. So November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Can you tell us about um, the disease? Um, so Alzheimer's disease is actually the most common type of dementia. Um, I just want to make it aware that dementia and Alzheimer's are not the same thing. Alzheimer's accounts for about 60 to 80% of dementia that people have are in, in the world. Um, it's also the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. as well as in Wisconsin. Um, so it's a type of dementia that leads to memory, thinking, and behavior behavior problems. So symptoms include uh, memory loss, trouble planning and solving problems, confusion with time and place, misplacing things and unable to retrace steps, and mood and personality changes. So would, um, what would you say are some early warning signs that somebody may be developing Alzheimer's? So people may forget things that they learned, I would say, like yesterday or today. They forget easily. Um, they might forget what day it is. They might forget who they seen in the morning. They may forget what they ate. I always tell people the, the thing that you'll notice right away is that their short-term memory goes. Um, people with dementia, their last thing to go will be their long-term memory. So that will be their, their memories from when they're in their 30s and their 20s in high school. So yeah, um, an example that I've learned about Alzheimer's disease is that, um, say, an individual is like a pie maker of the family, and all of a sudden one day they screw up on a recipe that they've been cooking their whole lives. So that may be an indicator. Um, people who, who used to be really social throughout their lives all of a sudden are staying home more often. That's an early indicator. And if they're misplacing things, I mean, it's human that we misplace things, but if it's starting to become more of a habit, um, and if you're unable to retrace your steps, that's a really big indicator. At what age can Alzheimer's start? It can happen as uh, early as 20s. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the stages of Alzheimer's? Uh, there's actually three stages. Uh, you get the early stage, the middle stage, and the late stage. Um, I don't have no information on that right now, but people in Alzheimer's, they actually live the longest in the early stage. And in the early stage, you're not really going to notice um, because a lot of people are in denial. So, Okay. Um, so what is aging and long-term care doing to raise awareness? I actually do a Dementia Live um, experience training. I don't want to give away too much detail because it's it's a really great experience to put people through who's never experienced um, working in a nursing home or working with an individual who had memory problems. Um, it'll put you in the shoes of an individual with dementia for a little while. So we're doing that. Uh, we offer trainings. Um, we do memory screens every month at the clinic. Uh, we do memory cafes. Uh, we do Parkinson's support group. So, yeah, we're getting awareness out there. So we're trying to get every department, every every organization trained into becoming dementia-friendly. Can you um, elaborate a little on the memory cafes and the memory screens? So memory cafe is um, it's a social gathering. It's nothing where we don't teach about what dementia is. We don't. It's nothing about learning. It's just a social gathering where individuals with memory concerns and early Alzheimer's disease can come and do activities. We try to make sure it's different every month. Like last month, we went on a wagon ride. Um, this or next month, we'll be doing a fall activity, Thanksgiving activity. So we try to do it with the themes of the month, and um, we're trying to include our culture. So that's that's where. Menominee is different from other cafes within the state. So, And memory screens, um, it's just basically a baseline. I like to compare it to like a blood pressure reading. Um, it's not telling you that you have dementia or not. Um, it's just an indi early indicator. So it's a 10 to 15 minute test that we do. Um, and then you can have 
based off your results, you can either go to, um, you can go to your doctor. If not, you don't want it to share with any, with anyone. We'll keep it for six months to a year, and then we'll test you again to see where you're at. So, so if people are interested in attending either of these, how can they find out when or where? Okay, they, um, you have it on all the TVs, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can call um, me at Aging, 715-799-5270 uh, is my number. Or you can email me, kwaka at mitw.org. And there's uh, flyers throughout the community. So, The flyers are also um, going to be posted on the tribe's website under Community Events tab. They'll okay. also be posted on there. Um, anything else that you want to include as like a parting thought? I like to share that uh, if you guys see the purple shirts out in the community of the holding hands that represents dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. So if you see a lot of purple from aging, that's representing dementia. So if anybody would like to wear purple for November, it's raising awareness. So on this episode, we have conservation warden with us, Michael Riley. Um, what are some things that, um, conservation wardens do we'll patrol the wooded portion of the reservation and try to up uphold our ordinances and laws that pertain to keeping our resources and making sure this time of year it's november 1st so hunting is really kicked off today for descendants and tribal members so we'll be out in full force making sure everyone's hunting properly and safely everyone has their tags and a lot of people are gathering wood. We'll be checking for permits for that and hopefully not having to cite anyone, you know, make, make sure everyone's in compliance. So you mentioned hunter safety. What are some uh, ways that hunters can be safe? Well, we just completed our hunter safety with a large group of our youth here. Um, definitely wearing orange, being out on the road. And uh, the biggest thing we tried to push this year was, you know, not shooting down the road. A lot of uh, young guys out there might be running dogs or doing drives or just riding around being aware of, you know, what's beyond their target animal. You brought this up a little earlier, but can you explain the differences between the deer hunting seasons for enrolled tribal members, descendants, and spouses? So, oh, sorry. so August 1st, tribal members can hunt bucks only until September, and then September 1st, Tribal members can hunt bucks and does until December 31st. Um, the spouses and descendants will go along with the gun season with the state. Uh, what are some of the rules and regulations for deer season? Well, for deer, tribal members will have five tags. Um, they have to tag it immediately and keep it on until done processed and everything no shining of course still and being enforced is there any certain type of rifles they can and cannot use no we don't have any listed in our regulations you know obviously we would hope that the hunters are using something that would take their game down immediately and and not suffer how long does uh turkey season run okay Turkey season is, Turkey is going to start October 10th through November 30th. And then the first Saturday in April to the Sunday prior to Memorial Day. Okay, and then is turkey hunting um, tribal members only or is it open to descendants and spouses? Um, descendants can hunt it in the spring. Okay. Fall hunting is limited to tribal members only. Um, so... How did the hunters' safety education classes go that you were talking about earlier? Um, they were pretty cool. I was uh, is my first year as a warden and my first year going to a program like that. So it was Monday through Thursday, and then Saturday they had range time where they actually um, handled live weapons and fired them. So it was um, a lot of book work and interactive work, a lot of handling of the DNR provided us with some um, Real guns, but they're orange, and the firing mechanisms are taken out. So the students were able to get familiar with the common actions, like a lever action or bolt action or semi-automatic um, pump action or uh, brake action shotguns. 
and dummy ammunition. So they we ran them rep- repetitively through you know the actions loading and unloading and how to be safe with a partner or by themselves. Uh, what age can youth attend the hunter safety and education? Well, when I was talking to the instructor, they said it's at a sixth grade level, the um, the literature and the testing, but they were saying they've had kids come through that were younger. And I know it's a little bit different up here where versus the state where kids will hunt with their family. Mm-hmm. So 12 years and older, they have to have their hunter safety, and then they can be out there. And it says uh, persons between the age of 12 to 18 can hunt alone if they have passed their certified hunter education course. And then how often will you be, um, like, doing checks and stuff on, like, hunting? Um, Usually if I make contact with a vehicle, you know, it's that time of year, so I'll try and stop or pull up to them or get out the car and talk to them if they're out of their vehicle. You know, I'll ask who is, does everyone have their tags or permits for whatever they got going on. We have an active, <clears throat> excuse me, an active list and record of it at the office, and we're working on getting tablets in our squad so we can have access immediately. Uh, prior to this, I was a police officer, so I, you know, made a decent relationship with a lot of community members and familiar with faces and stuff, so I will follow up. If that person doesn't have their tags or permits, you know, sometimes we'll warn or sometimes cite them, give them a citation for not following those ordinances or laws. And then um, do you have any tips on, um, like, how to interact with DNR? <clears throat> I, I guess just be yourselves. I'm, I'm not um, trying to be any type of way if I contact with someone. You know, it's part of my job to make contact with tribal members in the woods and make sure everything is... Um, you know, going good and safe and everything, and then be on my way unless we're dispatched to a call or unless they called us regarding something they found or have an issue, you know, we try to handle it the best and efficiently as we can. Is there any rules or laws for, like, how long you can take to process a deer? Uh, You have to report it within 72 hours. You know, it's not really hard. We set up a, or, you know, the department set up an Internet posting way there's a phone number on every tag you know and you should be i'm usually pretty happy if i'm able to kill a deer so i call it in pretty quick you know now being a warden with my friends i told them you know put that tag on there before you take a picture because the first thing everyone wants to do is take a picture of the buck they killed or the doe they harvested i was going to ask about the website because i know that was set up yeah a couple of years ago so yes I've, i've never personally utilized it I like the phone call thing. It's a little bit faster, and I get it out of the way when I'm in the woods. You know, boom, call the steer in, and then it's done. Then figure out if we're going to continue hunting or go home and start taking care of it. Can you kind of uh, explain, like, that process of, like, how long can deer be, like, hung up for? Well, now that it's getting really cold, I mean, I remember when I was younger and I'd visit my grandparents in the open, I would see deer hang for quite a few days. Me, personally, I try to get it done that evening you know whether I get a deer in the morning or afternoon I try to get it done that evening skin it quarter it and take the parts I want into the house right away and refrigerate you know I'm picky I want my roast refrigerated a certain way and the rest I try to chop up and grind okay do you think there was anything we didn't cover as far as hunter safety or regulations that you would like to let people know about Um, no, we have a lot of these pamphlets. We have some, uh, semi updated ones and I guess just, you know, focus on being safe. The biggest thing I try to tell the youth that I was able to work with the last couple of weeks was, um, you know, just be mindful of what's down the road. I mean, that's the way accidents happen. You know, don't get too excited, but that's hard to say not to get too excited because, it's usually pretty exciting when you're out there hunting and you see one running on you. But, you know, I just told them, be, know, what's, know where your target is, know what's beyond it. Um, wear orange. You know, we're supposed to be wearing at least one article of blaze orange while we're walking around. You get to your stand, you can take it off and continue to be camoed out and try not to be seen. But 
I'm an advocate for our youth being out in the woods and interacting with, you know, family members. Those are, I'm sure everyone has good memories of that growing up and just to keep that going. So the pamphlets, where can people find those? At the conservation office, there's a very large box and the newer ones are going to be orange, just like this one in my hand here. And when they pick up their tags or if they have any questions, they can get ordinance printout or um, the copy of the pamphlet. Wyoming for listening to the MITW podcast. The MITW podcast will be uploaded monthly to keep you up to date with information from the nominee tribe and tribal departments. You can subscribe to the MITW podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. You can also listen to the podcast on menominee-nsn.gov. If you have questions or comments, you can email podcast at MITW.org. Follow us on Facebook by liking the MITW Podcast Facebook page.